So, good evening, everybody. The second life in this moment is a way also to escape from a rather grim reality here. And uh, I am afraid in Italy we are experiencing something which will become sadly familiar to all of you in the coming months. I mean, it's uh, this uh, pandemic is uh, spreading at the speed of the light. It's really one of the most unpleasant time in my personal life, I would say. In any case, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I hope that, uh, well, I mean, at the end, if you wish, I can give you more detail on what's happening here in Italy, but the situation is really unpleasant. And we took all the needed measure, measures well in advance, but not much to say. Okay, can you see the slides? Because I see them in a quite confused way. Okay, good. So, nice to be back. Thank you for inviting me again. It is always a pleasure to be in Second Life. Even though, as you can see from the bed shape of my avatar, I'm not anymore as a frequent customer as I was in the past, but I mean, uh, I even forgot how to assemble some details of my avatar. Must work on it. Okay, tonight I'm going to speak about something completely different from what are my normal research interests. And therefore, uh, it, this is not really a seminar, it's just, you know, a, a set of thoughts. So, thoughts on uh, which. I and some friends from the philosophy department here at the university are beginning to put together. And everything starts from our deep belief that even though methods and goals are often different, uh, there is a substantial uniqueness in the way Human, human brain, humans react to external stimuli. And therefore, that there is a very strict link, very close link between arts, physics, uh, biology, all sorts of sciences, you know, and the human disciplines. But the, since I mean the topic is incredibly large, I uh, will focus on two aspects which I think are particularly interesting because they are also they also give a very clear example of what we mean a unique framework in which the human being develops. And these basically these two contexts are painting and physics. But the same type of thoughts which I will expose tonight can be formulated can be developed in each in each field i mean it's uh, it would, doesn't matter whether it is literature or painting or uh, sculpture or uh, music I mean, basically the same consideration all true in all cases so let's start let's see if everything works fine yes so basically the Tonight's thoughts will focus on these four uh, different points. Has science influenced arts? But also, has art influenced science? I mean, usually there is a clear-cut answer to the first question, and it is obviously yes, because, you know, artists use a lot of uh, technological developments. They use a new type of materials for colors. They use new type of materials for uh, expressing themselves. They, you know, use perspective, which is based on geometry. Many artists also use math. Therefore, there is no doubt that in some sense, science has influenced arts. And also, the second question is hard influence the science is something which is you know a little less obvious but the answer is yes because science uh, has been inspired you know by many needs in the fields of architecture in the fields of music 
Therefore, I mean, these are trivial questions which basically do not deserve much of your time and of my time. The problem, the second two questions, uh, the second set of questions is, are true art and science possible outside of a culture in the anthropological sense? And I will try to show that it is, the answer is somewhere in the middle between yes and no. Uh, here, as culture, we mean you know, what defines a culture, like the Inuit in uh, in, uh, in the Arctic regions, or you know the Native Americans in the. They are a culture, basically. They are a set of um, behaviors and of traditions, or myths, or legends, which define a culture. And so, and the second question, which is, does it make sense to keep arts and sciences separate? Uh, if so, what is the criterion to separate them? And the answer is obviously not. But not so obviously, I would say, because many people keep uh, claiming that there is a sort of a distinction. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that many of you have heard people who say, well, you know, I have an artistic temperament. I understand nothing about mathematics. Like, they are two different things. And Chantal knows that I am prone to use trivial language, but this is plain bullshit. Not so, I mean, culture is just one. Of course, we cannot control all of it just because of you are, we are limited in the capability of our brain, but the intermingling of different disciplines is so strong that there is no way to separate science from art or from any other form of intellectual or from any other intellectual process. But let this is a frame, the general context of the framework. Let's go to some more detailed thing. In the relationship between art and science, let's focus on some similarities where, which you can find in the way professionals describe their work. I mean, therefore, in the way artists define art and in the way scientists define science. Both of them are organized in perception of reality. On this, there is no doubt. No one of us doubts that an artist tries to represent something accordingly to some paradigm which he developed in his brain, and that this paradigm is strongly influenced by everything that artist do in his life. I mean, the way he was, grew up, what he studied, and so Therefore, Roy Lichtenstein, a famous artist in, uh, of the 60s, said that organized perception is what art is. Paul Gauguin said something which is very familiar to what we claim in science, that there are only two types of artists, evolutionaries and plagiarists. Rainer Maria Rilke, the famous writer, poet, says that art is an explosion of clarity. So basically, it's the eureka moment. You suddenly understand something that you have never understood before. And Emil Zola, who is a very famous Italo-German writer, also said that art is nature as pursued through a temperament, because basically it's the same thing which Roy Lichtenstein said many years later. And now about science. Well, there is no art without facts and no science without fantasy. This is again a writer, Vladimir Nabokov. But Thomas Kuhn, who is one of the most famous philosophers of science, one of the most famous epistemologists, says that there is a revolutionary science and paradigmatic one, exactly like in art. Mike Norton says that dreams are what guide us and art is what defines us, math is what makes it all possible, and love is what lights up our way. And finally, more famous than anyone else, René Descartes, Jesus, says, with me, everything turns into mathematics. Philosophical issues related to scientific discovery rise about the nature of human creativity, specifically about whether the eureka moment can be analyzed and about whether there are rules, algorithms, guidelines, or heuristics, according to which such a novel insight can for the encyclopedia of philosophy. 
Okay, so basically both fields, if we want to separate them into fields, give more or less the same description of what they're doing and what of their goal. Methods can be different, but the final goals and the purpose is the same. A description of life. And uh, I also would like to point out this statement from Jean-Louis Piaget. I don't know whether you ever heard of him. I'm quite sure you have. He is one of the most outstanding figures in the field of uh, uh, ch ch children's psychology, basically. He has been studying the the way human beings develop consciousness and thought since, you know, more than 40 years. And, and everything, most of what we know nowadays comes from his research. And he says that also that human knowledge is based on vision. From vision, we derive abstractions. This is true for artists. For artists, this is true for scientists, this is true for everyone else. Our paradigm, our perception of the world, our perception of the society depends on vision. If you think about it, almost the, all the concepts we use are based on some visual perception. Even in geometry, we need to visualize vision. Only in very high level, very high level mathematics, you stop visualizing things because you start, you know, understanding formulas. But all the rest is based basically on, on vision. And vision is what defines basically what we are at the end. I am not going to give. Uh, much detail about this because that is a different topic. But nowadays it is also clear that uh, by understanding vision, we are capable to understand human intelligence and also, you know, to build the foundation for the artificial intelligence to come, which is basically the ill. Uh, this is <clears throat> sorry. This is the a slide which I presented in my other talks, the one about the work I do, which is the way humans develop uh, their knowledge. I mean, when, when a baby is born, he starts building categories on, uh, on the basis of, he's an empty uh, tablet, basically. He's a, he has no a priori knowledge. He has just, you know, very sophisticated software inside it. And by being exposed to thousands of sounds of images and so on, he trains his neural networks. And from, for instance, from the vision of several tens or hundreds of bottles, it defines an idea of a bottlehood which he will keep for all his life, and which will allow him to recognize a bottle all along with his this is true for the idea of space, for the idea of time, for, for everything, you know, for the idea you know, of dog. All concepts we have in, have in our mind are the results of a similar process, where basically our brain gathers examples from external stimuli and converts them into abstract concepts. How can this help us in what we want to talk? I mean, we have to make choices in what we are going to discuss because you know arts and science has been around have been around for more than for a few thousand years. I mean, but we have very well defined epochs in which you know both of them had quite strong person. We could focus on classic Greece. We focus on on Egyptian science and art, or we could move to Renaissance, but basically, or, or we could go, you know, to the late Renaissance, to the work by Galileo, but what I think it's more useful is to focus on the most recent of this revolutionary period in which things began to change, therefore we shall focus mainly on the relationship between painting and physics at the beginning of last century. Uh, I want to emphasize 
this sentence by Pablo Picasso because uh, it's exactly in the same line of what we are saying. I mean, many people believe that art is talent and science is a study. It's absolutely not true. Art, everything, to, to achieve excellence in any field, you need to study a lot. Doesn't matter whether you are a scientist, doesn't matter whether you are an artist, doesn't uh, matter whether you are a painter or a musician, but if you want to master a field, you need to acquire, to develop an awareness of what has been done in that field and what will take place. So, I mean, I often laugh when I see people who suddenly, you know, because they have not much more to do, decide, you know, to become artists in order, you know, to fill their, their free time. I mean, art is a serious business, exactly like science, like mathematics, like physics, like biology. You can be an amateur, but if you want to be a professional, you need to be. To spend, let's say, your proper share of years studying what has been done before and where you are now. Because if you don't do this, you never do anything really original. Okay, uh, please look carefully at these two paintings. I think they are the best exemplification of what we are going to say. I mean, I am not going to tell you for the moment the name of the painter, but it's just to prove what I'm saying, that basically an artist is not someone, a real artist, is not someone who, like, you know, a romantic creature who, you know, and just as a talent and from one day to the other starts doing master. And uh, remember these two paintings, please. It will be a surprise. To give you an example, I already shown this, uh, this slide in my astronomical paintings. And to tell you the truth, this is also where my interest in the relationship between paintings and science began. I mean, many years ago, I was visiting the Prado Museum in Madrid, and I saw this wonderful painting of Paul Rubens. Rubens was one of the most best painters of the 17th century, which depicts Saturn devouring its children, his children. It's fantastic. One thing, I am an, originally I was an astronomer, and therefore one thing caught my attention, and there are those three, three stars which are in the, in the ellipses, which are above, above the, the gold. Why? And this is a proof of how how cultured, how deep was the culture of Paul Rubens? Look at the date, 1636. At that time, there were no professional journals. There was obviously no internet, neither telephone or things like this. And the news spread of scientific discoveries and so on, spread across Europe at a very low speed to go from from Florence to Paris could take even more than two weeks, four weeks of travel. Therefore, try to imagine how how much time it would have taken, you know, for the news to spread across Europe. Years. Okay. Why there are these those three stars above Saturn? The explanation is quite intriguing. In uh, sorry. Uh, now and again, I make the same mistake. Okay. Well, it's quite intriguing. In, in 1610, Galileo Galilei he sent a strange anagram uh, to some of his correspondents. Uh, you know, before scientific journals were established, I mean, scientific anagrams were used to claim a priority when you had discovered something, but you were not so sure about its interpretation. So you didn't want to make a fool of yourself claiming that you had discovered something, but you also wanted to avoid that someone else could discover it before you. So uh, Galileo, Kepler, many others, use uh, uh, Christian Huygens and so on, 
used to send these letters where they made anagrams which contained the discovery but were not easy to be understood and uh, this anagram meant something very simple altissimum in latin altissimum planetum tergeminum observavi which translated is I observed the highest and more distant planet as a triple star. When Galileo pointed this telescope to Saturn, he saw it as a triple star just because his telescope, and this is something which should be remembered when we discuss Galileo, his telescope was very bad, terrible quality, terrible glass, terrible aberration, so he could not see the rings which we know surround Saturn, but this, uh, the planet as it is depicted on the first image on the upper left corner of the slide, like a main central body with the two smaller bodies on the side. The other drawings represent the way the other astronomers you see there on the right side observed the planet. The first one to realize in 1651 that what they were observing was not you know, a triple body or renowned for our things like this, but the pl planet with the ring was Christian Neugand, no, uh, Gian Domenico Cassini, sorry, in No, Christian Neugand. It was much time later. What does it mean? That for Rubens, he was a painter was informed on the most advanced discoveries in the field of astronomy. Uh, Rubens was working in Spain at the time, I'm quite sure. Galileo was in Italy. Communication was very slow. Took place through very informal, very strange channels, but already 20 years later, Rubens was aware of the discovery of Galileo of Saturn as a triple star and when he painted the Saturn, the god Saturn, there and his children, he also wanted you know, to celebrate the discovery by Galileo by putting those three stars on the top of the painting. Okay, this is a typical example. Examples like this are all over the history of science in the history of picture. You can find them everywhere, uh, from the Neolithic uh, uh, paintings, uh, you know, to through the whole history of uh, modern art and, uh, and science. I mean, the two communities have always been very well informed of what the others were doing. But the main thesis behind these, uh, the behind this presentation is another one. In, and let me first present the thesis and then to give some evidence about that. We, I think we'll write, at the end of a longer thought, we'll try to write something about that. But the situation is evolving. Human culture is one. The social paradigm changes because of, you know, Modification in the environment changes in, in, the, in the social structure and so on. And the perception that humans as a col collective entity have of this change in paradigm changes. And our way of representing this change obliges us to make deep changes in all fields. So we have just one slow adjustment of the cultural paradigm to an evolving reality. And this adjustment takes place in all fields. Arts, music, history, whatever, science. And in some cases, artists come before scientists. And in other cases, science anticipates art. So basically, what you find is that in the same period, there are incredible revolutions in arts, incredible revolutions in science, focusing on the same topics. And that these revolutions 
sometimes take place first in the arts and sometimes they take place in science, but it's a matter of years, not of uh, decades. It's just in few years. One comes slightly before the other. And the fantastic example of this is what happened at the beginning of the 20th centuries. Okay, there that has been one of the most prolific, most creative moment in the human history. I mean, on the one end, uh, art was completely revolutionized by, you know, the, what we shall see in a few seconds. Basically, we left the realism to move to uh, or post impressionism to move to something completely different, which is ambassador art. And uh, in science, we moved from classical mechanics to to special relativity, general relativity, and you know, from uh, classical physics to quantum mechanics. And in both cases, the the key factors was a different perception of space and time and of light. And this is quite amazing because <coughs> both communities were conscious that they had to change the way they were understanding the main concept of space, time, light, and matter at the same moment. And they did it in two completely different ways at the same time. In some cases, physics was first, and in some cases, art was first. And I think this is the best proof that there is a hidden engine in human culture which pushes forward and um, with no clear cut distinction between the fields. Different fields are something which we use to organize our knowledge, not exist at all. So, um, just a few words about uh, the starting point, which is primitive art. And I mean, it's very well, it's believed nowadays, and I, I, I think most of us agree with that, that the primitive art and uh, also, you know, uh, tribal art and uh, and most of oriental art have a completely different understanding of space and time with what respect with what we do nowadays i mean because the uh, if you look at the work of art from uh, very early ages or you know from uh, far east you find that the artist does not depict the object as it is, you know, in a realistic approach. But basically, it the, they try to represent what the artist feels about that object. So basically, uh, this thing, these feelings, this uh, interpretation of the objects are represented on pottery, ropes, fabrics, you know, it's a simple geometrical forms. And each one of these forms is usually charged with symbolic meaning. Also, what you see is that the perception of space and time in both primitive and oriental culture is not Newtonian at all. We shall be more clear about this in a few seconds. Here, for instance, you see these fantastic uh, drawings by uh, Chinese painters, you know, early painters, 12th century where you see the immortal and splattered ink on the left, which I think is fantastic. It's something which you, in the West, we began to see only very recently, in the last 50, 60 years. So, you know, the primordial chaos, which reminds us of a fractal structure, you know, on the, on the right side. I mean, it's, but also, if you go and see what the anthropologists say about uh, the these uh, tribal artists, see that basically they do not have a perception of reality organized in strict concepts of space and time as we do. And uh, for instance, the Inuit from the no Arctic Circle is that they don't perceive the space as static. Space, I mean, they live in, a, in an environment where basically there are no 
reference points, points. and they do not have a, a well-defined set of units or measures for space, and they have no uniform division for time. They basically perceive space and time on something which is ruled by nature. And in their artworks, you have something Escher-like. Basically, the object feels the space and defines the space. And this is really completely the opposite of what was taking place in the in the Western art in the late 19th century, let's say, till the beginning of the 20th century, when something happened in the West. In Sorry, this is, has nothing to do with it. Uh, okay, so remember this. I mean, primitive art is a non-Newtonian, non-Euclidean perception of space and time, and space and time depend on the observer depend on the observer and are not defined in an absolute way. On the other side, before 1905, in physics, I mean, the paradigm was ruled by Newton, where time and space were something completely different, where, and it was the absolute true and mathematical time. Basically, it was a time which was <coughs> defined independently of the observer, outside of the observer, <coughs> which existed in spite of the observer. And this suddenly changed in physics. Let's see first what happened in physics and then we go ahead. In 19, Planck realized that light is not a continuous, but it's basically a, an ensemble of particles and, start, and basically changes the nature of light. In 1905, Einstein demonstrates that this light is <coughs> is also the property of a, a physical body. It is not a wave. In 1905, again, Einstein reformulated the concepts of space and time with special relativity, the, saying that the space and time are no longer absolute, but uh, they depend on the relative state of motion of the observer and of the observer the event. So basically, you know, there is a contraction of space-time depending on the speed which two objects are moving relative to one another. So basically, space and time began no longer absolute but relative. There was a lot, you know, also of misunderstanding about the meaning, the meaning of this relativity, but it was a momentous development, but it was not the end of the story. Because in physics, in the coming years, there were other revolutions when uh, the Broglie, the Broglie demonstrated that in uh, 1924, that light was both wave and particles, and that particles were both wave and solid matter. So basically, there was no longer a clear cut distinction between particles of matter and particles of light. They basically were different when shared many properties in common. This led the year after at the birth of quantum mechanics in by Heisenberg and Schrodinger. And uh, where the main idea is that there is no longer clear cut separation between observer and observed. So basically nature does not exist by itself. By what we perceive of nature is affected by the observer, but also nature itself is affected. Observed ob entities and observers are intrinsically coupled. So this was an incredible change on the way, in the way space, time, light, matter had been conceived in the preceding years. Okay, let's see what happens in art. Before 1905, many things had already begun happening in the field of revising the general idea of space and time. And, but the struggle reached the, the peak in the years between 1905 and 1908, 
especially in France, uh, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Russia, where basically it became clear that the impressionist approach was over and that uh, the double perspective uh, geometric construction, which was at the base of the impressionist, did not reflect anymore the needs of the current paradigm. And they also realized that art had reached the limit and they had to move out of the two-dimensional limitation posed by the canvas. And very nice thing. So let me go back to that to two paintings which I showed before. Uh, if you don't check on the internet or if you don't know before, can you guess who painted these two paintings? I'm looking at the chat to see the answer. Who is the painter? Don't check on the internet. What do you think? It's Picasso. Pablo Picasso. Before 1905. This is what I was telling you. Picasso, before revolutionizing modern art, had studied for many, many years. He was a fantastic painter also by himself. He was also a fantastic painter by, let's say, classical standards. He knew everything he had to know about painting. He knew everything about what, to, but at some point he felt like the perception of reality he had was no longer matched by the, by the current artistic paradigm. And what, where was the breakpoint, the breakthrough point? Let me move my mouse. Here we are. Okay. Here, 1907. Two years after the Einstein paper, which, remember, did not become very popular until few many years later, let's say in 1910, at the Museum of Trocadero in Paris, there was an exhibit of African masks and landcraft, which really shocked the artistic world. Because for the first time, artists who were looking to a new way of expression, this is before, found what had been missing in art at that point. And in their art, had missing, what was missing was exactly the same thing which was missing in physics before 1905. A coherent representation of space, time, light, and matter. Look at that. In this is the second one is 1895. In a few years later, Picasso was painting the Demoiselle de Vignon, which is completely different. What is the meaning of this revolution? Uh, Picasso had to be shocked by the discovery of the non-Euclidean geometry, of the breaking in planes and of the different perception of space and time, which was present in primitive art. And you can see, if you compare on the right side, you see the right corner of the painting, you see there is a the face of a mademoiselle, which is identical to a, an African mask. He took inspiration from these uh, uh, new understanding of, uh, and he decided, together with the many other painters, that what was missing in painting was the perception of space and perception of time. And that space and time depended on the observer exactly as it was being discovered in physics. Let me show you a few examples. Cubism. Basically what uh, Picasso started was cubism. The, in, uh, this is a fantastic painting by George Brack, uh, who is depicting a village. And you can see okay, here, objects are decomposed in visual fragments. 
you don't have anymore the house as a unique piece. You decompose the house in many pieces. These are redistributed over the canvas in such a way that there is no, the observer cannot read it anymore in a sequence. And all fragments which compose the image are perceived simultaneously. As Gertrude Stein said, is there is no there, there. Basically, there is, you are delocalizing the observer. Even more fascinating is this uh, violin and candle on the left side, where you can see the violin for all possible perspectives simultaneously. This is a way, basically, instead of rotating the object, instead of looking at the object in a temporal sequence from different angles, uh, from different angles, you see all angles simultaneously, and you leave to your brain the the task of reconstructing the object. Look also on the, on the right side, Diego Rivera, with the Zapata style landscape, where again, you have a painting of Zapata, where you see all the items all together, and you have this fragmented perception of reality. This was one way to react to the new stimuli, but there are many others. Let's forget this one because otherwise we run very long. Another one was the surrealism and relativistic distortion, which was introduced by, by many people, but mainly by Salvatore Dali. Salvatore Dali was uh, also depicting very clearly the disruption of time. In painting. Here you see these clocks, you know, slowly melting down, slowly adapting to the environment. It was a realistic representation of what was taking place in, a, in art. And that these people knew a lot about science. You can also have a proof in this coming fantastic painting, which is not less known, which is uh, Corpus Hypercubus by Salvatore Dali, where the cross is transformed in a tesseract. And all mathematicians in the audience know that the tesseract is a 3D dimension, the three dimensional projection of a four dimensional hypercube. Again, Dali is putting the uh, element of perception of space and perception of time into a painting which only in appearance looks uh, uh, realistic, just because you can recognize the bodies, but the hidden meaning is very strong. I mean, you, here you have a higher dimensionality of the image, which just projects in one moment. So it's really, yeah, it's like breaking boundaries between space and time. I absolutely agree. Read, I read the comment in the, in the chat. Art Nouveau, again, starts at the International Exposition in Paris, before, well before the physics revolution in 1900. And this is absolutely transversal in architecture, painting, design. And it was dictated as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it deeply changed the way things were perceived. Look at this. In that period, before it happened in, in physics, remember 1900, the, the work by Max Planck, arts had realized that the perception of light was wrong. Right. And they moved from impressionism to post-impressionism, where basically the uh, light was reproduced by colors, no longer with the details, but just like blobs of colors, very strong colors. This was called fauvism. From fauvism, it's basically derives from beast, from uh, savage. And uh, it was a very short period, but basically <coughs> it was a moment when <coughs> the Impressionist movement ended and because it had exhausted its possibility to represent the light and uh, the Artists had discovered the light at much more in it than it 
to that time. And I think this fantastic uh, painting by Matisse is really one on the left side. It's a clear sign that perception is changing. Another example, and we are slowly running toward the end also because it's running late. I want to tell you about Futurism. Futurism was a movement which started in Italy, but had a huge impact all across Europe, which was started by a crazy guy, Filippo Tommasi Marinetti. He was very intelligent, very smart, very brilliant, but completely weird. Who basically was impressed by the Industrial Revolution, was impressed by the speed of the modern world. By, and he realized that time was crucial in art. But time means movement. So he represented the time not as the Cubists have done, but trying to put the movement into the painting. And some of his paintings, like this one by Umberto Boccioni, was a famous, oh sorry, I didn't translate it. It's a famous Italian painter of, of the Futurist movement. He tried to show here the growing city. And basically, structure here are blurred out by the movement. You don't have anymore a, a single object, but you have just objects which are evolving across the canvas. Here, this is a cyclist by a, a Russian futurist painter, Natalia Goncharova, where you see that basically she's decomposing the cyclists in different frames, like in a picture, like in a film. And this is showing frame after frame. So you have this tribal image. So again, time becomes a crucial aspect of the paintings and its relation with, with the observer. This is something which you find nowadays everywhere. Uh, I don't. I cannot see this painting very well. It must be very heavy. Let's see. Uh, Baron, while the, I I cannot see the image, but what you are saying is, it's crucial. The motion lines were the 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 starting point of the futurism uh, of the futurist uh, paintings. They really the, the, called them dynamic lines. They called them uh, uh, evolution lines, and they were really driving their uh, uh, the construction of their paintings. So, sorry, uh, can you see this painting? Because I cannot see it very well on my PC, so I think I must move to the other one. It is not loading properly. Okay, now. Uh, I don't know how to load the video into the uh, into the Second Life, but if you click to this link, the one which you see here, if you wish, I can try to put it in the chat. It's uh, uh, this is a subsequent evolution of the relationship between work of art and observer. This goes more on the quantum mechanics uh, perception. And this also took place more or less simultaneously, where basically the work of art was not unique. It depended on the position of the observer. Uh, so let me see if I, uh, if I can copy it for you in just a second. I'm trying to do it. Okay, I'm trying to find it in the original and I'll put it on the chat. Okay, here we are. I did. Okay, so, what is it? Okay. I think you should be able to, to open it from there. And, uh, this 
is one of the many examples, now we have a modern art, where basically the perception of an object is not unique. It depends on the observer. The object changes as a function of the position of the observer, of the, uh, of the time in which it is observed and so on. So it's, a, it's an attempt to bring subjective perception into art. And I can show you a, another example here. This is a fantastic piece of work by Shigeo Fu, Fukuda. I don't know whether why the image doesn't show you properly, but you please Google up this guy and look at this work of art. This is basically a conglomerate of forks and spoons. When, but when you lighten it from a different perspective, it uh, forms different objects. Like, in, uh, I'm sorry you cannot see on this image, but this is really... Uh, uh, let's see if it is in the next one. I have a problem with my... Ah, here we are. If you put the lightning in a proper place, for instance, it becomes a motorcycle. That one, the shadow, that structure becomes a motorcycle and so on. And modern art is full of these things where basically he's trying to reproduce the relation between observed and, uh, and uh, observable. Look at this fantastic modern sculpture. Okay, what is it? Really, I'm not kidding. I'm asking you. Write it on the show. It's a piano. Yeah. If you look at it from a specific position, that one is a mirror. It's a perfect piano. Quite impressive, isn't it? And, uh, yeah, playing with the perspective, but something more than that, playing with the observer creating that feeling of innocence. Okay, so let's try to sum up the, something about this original, these initial thoughts about something. It's the idea, our understanding part, the one on which we are working now, it's that when society confronts with the new stimuli, it'll the interaction with the new types of images, new types of concept, which, for instance, uh, arise from uh, a huge shift in technology or a huge shift in uh, societal structure, need to be reorganized. Just, you know, it's a sort of compression algorithm. We need to reorganize our way, our way of perceiving reality in order to be able to handle it. And uh, revolutionaries, doesn't matter whether they are artists or scientists, create symbolic languages which basically are able to express these new ideas much before words can do it. And uh, so it's a sort of pre-verbal status of human knowledge where images come first and words second. And uh, this applies to all field of human knowledge. I'm just focusing, but you can find similar stories in music, in uh, mathematics, in everything. The reflections and conclusions, basically humans are social animals. And they participate to the current perception paradigm. But when we say social paradigm, this is something deeper than what we usually mean with this. Humans are no longer Darwinian animals. You know that evolution, you know, rules the world. But evolution is, for the humans has assumed a completely different meaning. Because when you deal with the Darwin evolution, you are saying that basically if there is a change in the environment, a change in the habitat, by genetic modification, the species adapt to the changing environment. Since we have discovered the fire, it is no longer like that. Human beings 
react to a changing environment by cultural evolution. So the fact that we are social animals, social animals with the technology, has changed deeply the way we adapt to our environment. Uh, in other words, if it gets cold, we do not grow hair, we start a fire. And this is really the main thing behind it. As a species, we need to react to a changing cultural and changing natural environment. And uh, basically, the cultural environment is what matters more until we survive. Then if the environment kills us, it's a different story. But as long as we can survive into the environment, I mean, the cultural environment is what shapes us. And this forces us, you know, to go through a cultural ad adjustment which takes place across all boundaries of human knowledge. Uh, yeah, there is a reflection. There is nothing more conformist than the so-called anti-conformist. Because basically, the anti-conformists usually are people who just, you know, are adopting a new paradigm. But basically, from the anthropological point of view, it's, it's nice. The, okay, yeah, exactly. We are still evolving, but and very fast. I am afraid, I don't know how the world will come out of this coronavirus business, because this is really going to change a lot our society. Okay, the okay, so basically, yeah, I'm just repeating what I was saying, and uh, and I just want to to show you a book which is where all these things initially started. You should, if you can find it, read it, it's very interesting. And, <coughs> And there is a proof of what I'm saying. It was not written by either by an artist or by a physicist. It was written by a cardiologist. It's really a fantastic book. Where some of the things I've been mentioning, you can find them there, but there's much more to say. So thank you very much for listening. And as I said, you, I mean, I, this is just work in progress. I'm done. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. If you have any question, I guess the other five minutes before my dinner time. Oh, about the situation in Italy. To tell you the truth, it's, uh, it's, it's, now it's bound to improve for the simple reason that we adopted uh, this containment procedure. Basically, we are isolated in the house. You are not allowed uh, to walk outside of your house in many parts of Italy, for instance, in Naples, where I am, I am teaching classes online and, you know, I'm doing exams online. It's basically, you can go out of your uh, or buying uh, essential food or drugs or things like that, but you cannot walk. I mean, all shops are closed with the exception of pharmacies and a few grocery stores and uh, but you know life uh, is quite orderly even in Naples it's incredible I mean the community is reacting in a wonderful way I mean it's and uh, I am afraid that there is no safe place I mean in fact I'm really to tell you that I'm scared by the, the level of you know I am how I'm Italian, but I spent so much time it's that the so we low news in the 
at least as much as I follow news in Italy. And I am really astonished by the level of incompetence of Masate. I mean, I know it's not politically correct, not Trump. He's been acting like there was no real danger about the virus to spread all across the so, I mean, I'm afraid that you will lead to the same problem as we are having here in Italy, but uh, don't be scared. I mean, just follow the rules, keep isolated for time, and, and life will uh, slowly go back to a, to a different normality, because I think the, this, uh, this pandemia is going to teach us a lot. It has been changing the way we live in Italy, and that's, uh, that is something that they've never expected, to tell you the truth, because Italians are deeply rooted into their... Uh... If it has changed our way of living, I'm sure it can change the way of living of everyone else in the world. It's... Uh... Uh, it's something to be extremely careful with. But for the rest, I mean, life is normal. Just social life has disappeared. You know, it's... Uh, one advantage here in Italy is that we have a strong public health system. Huge. I mean, uh, even if you are an homeless, you are hospitalized for free and everything, you get everything for free and uh, you get fantastic treatment even if you are poor and i am afraid that in realities where this is not true i mean uh, this is going to hit very badly on the on the poorest and on the less rich layers of the population i mean it's and i i, I think that after this pandemia will be over the intelligent people in the world should be able to rethink many of their beliefs, beliefs. Yeah, people in camps like in Greece, yeah, I agree. So my friends, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my ideas. Now I must end because otherwise my wife is going to kill me because they're waiting for me for dinner. Thank you very much, Chantal. It's always a pleasure to be here. I hope to see all of you soon. And be safe. Worry a little about these things. Make all precautions and be safe. Bye to everybody. Goodbye.